Roll. We are recording. All right. Well, hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson with Rackin, and welcome to version 020, our 20th uh, meetup for the Digital Rebar Community Group. Uh, today, we've got a good group of folks on board. And as always, I have to remember to open my uh, chat uh, window so we can talk to Kat because he didn't like talking. Kat got his tongue. Okay, that was a bad one. Uh, today, everybody, we're going to be talking about Net Wrangler. Net Wrangler is uh, a new piece of, of component that Victor has been working on that allows us to do configuration of network uh, devices as part of workflow when digital rebar provision. We talked about that in version 19, got a little uh, introduction to the plans features, capabilities that we're looking forward to. And today we actually have a little bit of a minimal demo of that in operation and work. Uh, we also talked about uh, two weeks ago in version 19, we talked about available uh, crib installation. And we have a little bit of a demo walkthrough on that. I'm not gonna have as much of a demo as I'd hoped for today, um, but we do have a little bit of demo what it takes to get that set up and running still very uh, early alpha stages with the HA crib stuff. So it probably needs another uh, couple of weeks to shake and bake before we're gonna have it uh, production is ready for community in general, but that is moving along. Um, as always, we'll talk about community, uh, give the community a chance to ask questions, interact with us, um, ask whatever. So. Uh, with that said, uh, we have on the Rackend team on board today, we've got uh, Steven Spector, who is posing as Rob, uh, so he can do the video recording, and Victor Lowther, who will be doing our demo of Net Wrangler, myself, Shane Gibson. Uh, hoping a little later we'll have uh, the real Rob Hirschfeld drop in, and uh, Greg Altos as well. Uh, they may or may not make it in. They're in meetings uh, currently. Uh, but that's sort of it. Um, with that, let's um, Net Wrangler. So, Victor, uh, Net Wrangler was uh, a little bit of a request both from community and customers, I believe, uh, with an, a need and a requirement to be able to do complex network configurations within workflow, since that's one of the um, catch-22 things with provisioning is you need to be able to have a network to provision machines, and then you need to configure machines for its final network uh, role in, in life. And I think that um, Net Wrangler is uh, oriented towards that last piece, right? Being able to do the final production configuration of moving a machine's network interfaces uh, and configuration around to match the requirements of a production install. Um, can you give us a little bit of uh, background on some of the other uh, criteria or design goals that we're looking for in Net Wrangler, how we kind of went about uh, building. Sure. So the initial implementation of Net Wrangler uh, focuses on being an MVP uh, that runs um, either during the post install stage of uh, operating system installation. So like in the post section of the kickstart or the uh, or as one of the uh, post scripts of a uh, of a preceded installation, or as a part of the image deploy process after the image has been laid down, but before you've rebooted or k-exec into the final image. Um, its purpose in life is to take a uh, file, which um, from Digital Repark Revision will be provided as a, a template that gets expanded and filled out with some uh, useful information like uh, system MAC addresses and IP addresses that you want to have uh, set on the final configured interfaces um, that describe what you want the network configuration to look like. For the initial implementation, I've uh, chosen to use uh, the input file format described at uh, netplan.io as my uh, input format. And the uh, output is a collection of uh, system D, network D, um, configuration files. For those that uh, aren't aware, um, the systemd project has, gained, has uh, grown its own uh, new network configuration uh, management daemon along with its new, along with its own uh, config files. And those are 
config files that pretty much every Linux distro that use that uh, has been using system D or that has a system D that's uh, less than about three years old can use to configure the network uh, as opposed to whatever the distro's native stuff is. So like instead of the the sysconfig slash network config scripts for Red Hat and CentOS or the Etsy interface or the Etsy uh, network interfaces stuff for Debian or whatever weird XML format that uh, SUSE uses. Okay, and so kind of the goal is to provide a consistent uh, input to be able to define uh, how your network should look like and then Net Wrangler is responsible for making it so. Right. Um, one of the goals in uh, writing Net Wrangler, and this is actually what took most of the time, is to make it so that it's easy to add additional input and output formats. Um, one of our customers uh, has a requirement to be able to use uh, Net Wrangler to configure Windows interfaces, for example. And so while I haven't added it yet because I'm not a Windows guru, um, Net Wrangler is set up so there's a clean separation between an input format uh, the internal intermediate format that we use to represent a network configuration and an output format. So it's pretty easy to add additional inputs and output formats um, that get translated to the internal format, which kind of acts as a lowest common denominator network config or a lowest common denominator data format. Right. And so, and that's a good point in, in that right now, the uh, initial, uh, as you say, MVP minimum viable product, uh, is oriented at Linux and NetPlant IO input, but we have plans to add Windows and other potential inputs to allow it to make it easy for other shops that have other ways of expressing what their configuration should look like to be able to allow that to be uh, ingested and uh, output to uh, consistently manage and configure different operating systems and versions, network environments. And so, um, yeah, for example, pretty high on the list of priorities as to what to implement next is going to be uh, support for curtain config files where I would just extract the network section out of it and uh, write out uh, whatever is appropriate for the target. Right. So oh, excellent. Okay. Um, so where and so you the Windows side was the next piece. Um. That depends entirely on uh, how much assistance I can get in writing it out. I know that uh, pretty much for Windows, in order to support things, I'm either going to have to write out uh, JSON that gets ingested by a custom PowerShell script or just output a uh, PowerShell script that will do the configuration as a sysprep step. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's another thing. I. Don't think I mentioned uh, NetPlan or the uh, Net Wrangler is uh, not designed to take over tools like uh, NetPlan or SystemD, NetworkD, or um, you know native uh, runtime daemon management. Its entire goal is to write out the appropriate config files for whatever uh, whatever runtime subsystem configures the networks. So it's designed to operate sort of in tandem with an existing systems methods for deploying and configuring the network. Right. It's, it's not a new thing that's trying to do drive network configuration itself. It's designed to drive existing uh, tooling to be able to set and configure uh, networks on uh, various operating systems and methodologies. You know, the, the example being, uh, like you said, system D network D is one way of doing it. Managing the Etsy network script files itself is another way. There's network managers, a number of ways, unfortunately, on how to do that in Linux. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Um, you ready to show us a little something? Uh, yeah. I just need to uh, share my screen. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking of as a possibility is uh, we like to play around in the, the packet environment. We use packet bare metal systems a lot, and they have an API that describes the network environment as well. So it's actually possible that translating the uh, packet JSON structures to be able to realize their bonded network configurations would be something that could be added to uh, the net wrangler. That's an example. Right. 
Okay, and y'all should be able to see my screen now. Yep. Uh, if you could make the right uh, bond.yaml text a little bigger, it's fairly yeah, small. Don't worry. Don't worry about that. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna do All right. I'm not gonna worry about it. It's just there because yeah. I'm sharing a whole desktop. <laughs> okay. There. All right. So in this little demo directory, I've got uh, four different YAML config files that correspond to different uh, <clears throat> network configurations that we want to write out. So the whole point of Net Wrangler is to take um, to take a, a network config file, make sure that it's same, that it describes a valid network configuration. Um, pretty much what that means is that uh, if you have interfaces that build on, build on top of each other, that um, you don't form loops in your local network uh, configuration topology, uh, making sure that uh, input interfaces for one interface are valid and uh, like you're not trying to do something stupid like chain five VLAN interfaces on top of each other and uh, take care of those sorts of issues. So the first one I'm gonna show you is an example of a uh, bad configuration. Can you show us what's in that bad bond? Yeah, there, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So pretty much what this configuration file is going to try to do is going to define, uh, it's going to write out configuration files for three interfaces. The first one, Etho, is a physical interface that is, uh, that is on my local laptop. And it's going to uh, build a, it's going to try to build a bridge named test zero on top of it. And it's going to also try to build a bond named uh, bond zero on top of it. And so this is just the check to show you what happens when you feed it a bad config file. And in this case, NetPlan helpfully tells you that um, bridge test zero can't take over ETH zero because it's already owned by bond zero. And that's just the order in which it uh, traversed the config file. So that configuration file didn't write out anything. No extra system D directory. But if I do the same thing for a uh, bond, this just describes a uh, simple bond that uh, lives on top of my ETHO interface and is running in balance ALB mode. And uh, for those of you used to uh, numeric bond modes, that's mode six. And uh, I could get into the details of what each of those is, but that's probably beyond the scope of what we want to talk about right yeah, now. Yeah, that, that is beyond the scope. That's cool. So can you specify that it's six numerically or balance ALB is required by its verb? Uh, balance ALB is required by the verb. Okay. And so we net wrangler that bond.yaml, and this is uh, telling it to write out into the directory called systemd. Um, And uh, silence means everything went well. So if we take a look in systemd, we've got three network configuration files. Um, the first one is uh, a configuration file that describes how we're going to configure the physical etho uh, interface. And it's pretty simple. It just says, hey, we're defining, we're going to use a physical eth0 interface and we're going to throw a bond on top of it, named bond zero. And the way this works, we will have two other files. The first one is 60-bond0.netdev. Uh, and that describes uh, what kind of bond we're gonna build. And netdev just says, we're gonna name it bond zero, it's gonna be a bond and it's gonna run in balance ALB mode. And uh, any other options are set to their defaults. Um, to get a list of the options you want to read the system D, uh, dot net dev man page, I believe is the one. And then we have a third one, which describes the network configuration we're going to put on that bond. And that just says we're going to accept uh, any IPv6 uh, router advertisements. That's true by default for all of system. That's, that's true by default for all system D stuff. And we're going to give it an address of 
And that's just an example of a uh, kind of a simple layout. I've got a couple more complicated ones that are I named simple for obvious reasons. The, the more complicated ones are named simple. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, actually, no, this one just defines a single bridge that uh, lives on top of each zero. So we rewrite our config file with a simple bridge. And you dump that to systemd as well. Form and systemd is the format type? Yeah. Well, okay. systemd, or sorry, systemd here is actually the destination, so. Right, but does the system D and the desk name mean system D format as well as put it out uh, in the D directory? Uh, desk means the location to put whatever the config files you're writing are, or whatever config files you're going to write. Uh, out is the format to render to, and uh, okay. it defaults to system D. Okay, so the, the output format defaults to system D. Mm -hmm which is what you're showing us now. Yep. All right. So we'll do we'll show a slightly more complex uh, configuration. And this one builds a bridge and then throws a VLAN interface on top of it. So what it's going to do is it's going to build a uh, system D config stack that'll tell it to build a bridge named uh, test zero that has a 192.168.128.1. And on top of that bridge, it will um, attach a VLAN interface that uh, will tag any packets going through it or tag any outbound packets going through it with a, a tag for VLAN 50 and uh, only accept tags from VLAN 50. So we had uh, Chris uh, ask the question about the input YAML format. Uh, and what format that was, whether it was a Net Wrangler DSL, and and no, that's netplan.io currently, which is one of the input formats. And then one of the goals of the project for Net Wrangler is to be flexible on allowing uh, different input formats. Right now, netplan.io is the only one we support on the input side, and then there'll be uh, additional input filters for the future. Uh, but right now, netplan.io, and then. Uh, you said, Victor, the next one you were looking at was, uh, I just blanked on it. You said it a few minutes ago. Uh, you faded out, Shane. Uh, the next one I'm gonna, that I'm looking at is probably Curtain. As curtain, that's right. Format. Yeah. So the, the Curtain format would be the next p potentially uh, um, valid format. Okay. So let's go ahead and... Uh, Compile the one forward or the simple VLAN one. And now we have quite a few more config files. So let's. And so each zero is just uh, going to be owned by the bridge. Got the net dev file for the bridge that says it's a that says it's a bridge and it doesn't have any additional options. Uh, we have uh, the network configuration for the bridge that says that um, it has a sub interface named uh, VLAN zero, and uh, it had the bridge will have its own address of in the one twenty eight uh, in the one ninety two one sixty eight one twenty eight subnet. And we have a VLAN interface, and it's going to live. It's going to uh, that VLAN interface is going to live on tagged VLAN number fifty. And that VLAN interface is going to um, be the default gateway for the system and run it everything through one eighty two one sixty eight dot one twenty nine dot one. So. I didn't want to get too crazy in the demos, but one thing to note is that um, 
net plan or not net plan, but uh, net wrangler. Uh, when it's uh, pulling in the config files for the net plan format, it supports every configuration option that net plan does. So that includes all of the uh, all of the bridge options for tweaking how bridges run, all of the bond options for tweaking how bonds run, um, all of the address formats, both IPv4 and IPv6. Um, and it also supports uh, all of, it also supports defining multiple different routes using multiple different routing tables and multiple different routing policies. So you can do, so you, using, uh, using NetWrangler with the NetPlan input format right now, you can define, you can come up with some pretty hairy uh, network topologies locally, like uh, defining bridges on top of bonds with VLAN interfaces on top of them and multiple different uh, types of policy routes for multiple different address ranges. So you can uh, do crazy network segmentation stuff that frankly, I only half understand and Shane can probably explain better than I can. Cool, and so uh, netplan.io is actually the website as well. And then uh, they have a reference uh, documentation there. So if you have, you wanted to figure out exactly what those pieces are that we support, um, that's where you'd go to, to find the details of that for the moment. So yeah. netplan.io and then the reference documentation. Yes, and um, the reason that I didn't just use netplan.io directly is that it tries to be a long-lived daemon that uh, tries to support and drive everything that uh, systemd, networkd, and uh, network manager does. And it's uh, right now kind of Ubuntu specific. Um, I explicitly did not want to write a tool that had to be a long-running daemon. Um, I wanted, I needed a tool that was just a write out my config files and get out of the way. And I want to be able to handle uh, multiple different input formats and uh, output formats beyond just the two that uh, that plan supports. And that's why I didn't just go with their tool. Okay, cool. Uh, any more to show us there, Victor? Uh, nope, that's it for the demo. Okay, uh, any questions uh, from community? Uh, we had uh, Chris asking about input formats, but uh, anything else from community on that? Chirp, chirp. Okay. If uh, Victor, if you could uh, release your screen share, then I will take over. All righty. And there you go. And uh, what was I sharing? What am I doing next? Uh, question. <clears throat> I, I thought you had crib HA on the agenda. Yep, 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 yep. I'm just trying to get my. There we go. All right, so next up, uh, no, we don't want it the whole screen, you silly computer. Um, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so next up was HA Crib stuff. Uh, last uh, meetup in version 19, uh, Greg covered a lot of the um, components and design aspects of that. We'll cover a lot of that in today as we walk through. Uh, today I'm not going to run the actual demo for you. Uh, the demo takes a little while to run. It takes about uh, 10 or 15 minutes uh, to run through. And uh, we have another, what was that? Oh, so going back before I continue on, uh, Chris had another follow-up question on um, Net Wrangler. Uh, so yeah, so he was just as, oh, he's, he's observing. Yes, you got it, Chris, exactly. So he was just observing that the, the primary goal for Net Wrangler, uh, as Victor was saying, was to be able to be flexible on input output format uh, without being uh, a prescriptive daemon that tries to uh, get in the way of things and allows us flexibility on input and output. Um, yes. Exactly. Um, one of the things I wanted to avoid doing was being very prescriptive about how networks should be configured. And that is mostly because we did that in uh, the earlier iteration of our product in yeah. Digital Rebar version two. And uh, 
it wound up being sufficient for some things, but everyone wanted something that it didn't support and that would be a pain to make it support. Right. And so, and, uh, yeah. In a follow up on that was um, how it fits is um, part of how digital rebar provision works, which is unique for provisioners is our workflow capability and being able to walk a machine through stages to do something. Um, one of those uh, areas that uh, is very important to provisioning in production environments is to be able to match the network configuration of a given shop's environment. And that changes from machine to machine, from cluster to cluster, from data center to data center, et cetera. Um, you know, in, in some cases there might be a nice cookie cutter solution that the network team has in place, but in other cases there may not be. And so being able to flexibly define in that workflow uh, how to do the network configuration uh, is very important. And one of the things that we'll be looking at doing is going forward, uh, we have plans to do some inter more tighter integrations with IPAM. And so NetPlan, uh, or not NetPlan, but NetWrangler can be driven potentially going forward in the future to generate its input files based on information coming out of uh, IPAM or some other asset management or uh, infrastructure as code system that helps define this is how this machine is going to look based on X, Y, and Z factors. And then NetWrangler will be able to do that uh, network configuration part to drive it through that state transition to its final network configuration. Uh, okay, moving on uh, to HA Crib. So as I mentioned earlier, HA Crib is relatively uh, young. It's sort of a, a rewrite re and extension of the existing Crib uh, component. Uh, Crib today is a content pack that is injected as a regular piece of content, and we would see that in the portal under content packages. Uh, I'm on a really slow network here, so I apologize. So in this case, Crib is a completely separate component as a content pack. I don't have it installed because I have the HA Crib stuff installed as a plugin. And the plugin also injects uh, content as part of the plugin. And the two are mutually exclusive, so you can't have Crib and HA Crib installed at the same time. Uh, since they build, HA Crib builds off of Crib. Uh, a lot of the um, content pieces have the same name, so that uh, creates a namespace conflict in the layering, uh, virtual file system layering model, so we can't do that. Uh, so it's one or the other, you get to pick. Uh, HA Crib takes the basic concepts of Crib and extends it to uh, also uh, handle uh, indirectly certificate management through the certs plugin, which is another uh, plugin piece that is responsible for creating uh, sign, uh, signing certs and creating certificates to hand out to cribs to use uh, it through uh, configuration of the SED pieces that are used in crib. So crib will coordinate and orchestrate setting up a SED cluster. It'll set up the certs. It'll set up uh, Docker and Kubernetes, and it'll set up multiple masters and then it will create, uh, add the worker nodes into that cluster. So there's a, an awful lot of pieces that go into HA Crib. It's not um, a simple process. And unfortunately, uh, the Kubeatom components, which we rely on for the Crib pieces, don't have HA baked into them. So it's left to you, dear reader, to figure out how to do highly available Kubernetes if you're using Kubeatom. So we're still using the Kubeatom pattern within HA Crib that we used in uh, the first version, actually Crib V2, I guess HA Crib is V3 for us uh, technically, um, but we're still calling it 2.0.0. Um, we're still using the Kubeatom patterns for generating the cluster information for the joining tokens and doing those cluster actions to join tokens, uh, but HA Crib as a plugin uh, completely extends uh, beyond that to coordinate and uh, manage uh, the other layers of pieces that we need to be able to make highly available. Since Kubernetes, Kubeatom doesn't have any native highly available pieces. So we piece that together using etcd uh, for the key value store coordination. Uh, and then we use um, keep alive D and some other components in there. Um, but what I'm gonna do is just walk you through very quickly 
what it looks like to build a cluster. Now, today I only have a cluster with a single master um, because we haven't fully finished uh, some of the fine details around multi-master configuration yet. Uh, so I wasn't able to bring up a multi-master configuration. But if we take a look at our uh, primary uh, uh, crib cluster here, we see that uh, we represent the master with the anchor icon. So the crib, crib 01, node 01 is defined as the master. In this case, I set that specifically to be my master. I'm type A, ADD. I like to know exactly which master is going to be the master. Um, you can allow the cluster to elect a number of masters and it'll dynamically do that just like the original uh, crib uh, content pieces do. Uh, or you can predefine who your masters are. And in a lot of cases, if you're doing uh, bare metal, you're going to have different hardware profiles or SKUs that are for your masters versus your worker nodes as different hardware requirements. Or they may not, but in those cases, you definitely want to be able to define um, what machines become your master. So as with a traditional uh, crib process, we define the uh, basic information in a profile. And in this case, I named my profile KDS uh, one Live Demo. And if we take a look at that profile, um, actually, I'm going to take you to an example profile that's not configured, and then you'll see what were the pieces that we started with for the configuration. So that piece is a KDS2 example. So this is a profile example that is basically the bare minimum requirement for the HA crib pieces. We have some familiar uh, players in this component. So we have the crib cluster profile, which we, for those of you who have operated crib before, we define the name of the cluster, uh, the profile to store our uh, crib information in. Uh, we also have, um, I guess that's it for there. Well, extending into the HA pieces, we have these new pieces, crib cluster masters. So in this case, uh, this definition defines three masters for cluster master count three. In this case, I've only defined uh, one master. So what happens in this configuration is the first master or the seed master uh, will be built on this machine and then two machines will dynamically be elected to fill out the remainder of the master count. Now you can define nothing in the cluster masters, uh, in which case all three masters would be con uh, defined, or you can define two or three uh, machines similarly in the crib cluster masters parameter on this profile, and that will define specifically which machines become the master. Now to be able to support uh, highly availability, we need a virtual IP address we use uh, for the uh, HA proxy uh, load balance piece. So in this case, I'm using a uh, private IP, uh, uh, elastic IP on the uh, packet.net side, which is assigned and allocated uh, through packets uh, port, uh, portal. You can use a public IP address if you wanted to pay for a public IP address, uh, which would make sense for a publicly accessible uh, Kubernetes cluster. In this case, I don't want my Kubernetes cluster to be publicly accessible, so I'm using a private IP. Extending that, what is very new here is the etcd configuration. Uh, similar to uh, crib cluster profile, we have the etcd cluster profile. It's important to note that your etcd cluster can be completely separate and unique from your crib masters. So you could theoretically have three etcd um, cluster masters and three uh, crib cluster masters, Kubernetes masters that are separate machines, uh, or they can live on the same machine. Uh, in this case, uh, we are defining uh, that we're going to reuse the same profile that we're in. Uh, actually, if you caught my uh, error here, the name of my uh, profile is KDS2 example, and I didn't rename the example. This is the one I cloned it from. So. Um, in this case, it should be KDS2 example if I was following uh, the pattern correctly, but you see where I'm, I'm going with that. Again, etcd has a server count as well to define the number of um, machines within the etcd cluster that should be used. And then similarly to the crib cluster masters parameter, we have the etcd servers parameter, which is a similar definition. So in this case, we see that uh, the machine uh, named crib1 one, node1 one, uh, becomes the, the 
uh, crib master, Kubernetes master, as well as the SED master. That's like I was saying, not necessary, but if you're going to have some master machines and it's appropriate to co-locate those, you certainly can do that. Uh, so that's sort of the basic uh, configuration requirements necessary to get things started. When you select your machines, similar to the crib proto, uh, uh, content, you select all of your machines, you apply the appropriate profile to the machines, as you see we've done here, and then we kick off the crib cluster uh, workflow. You'll see uh, in the next couple of weeks, there'll be a number of stages and workflow pieces that are extended uh, and added to the HA crib uh, comp content. And in fact, we have a lot of that done already. Uh, it's just not all finished and fit and finished and tested, so I, I couldn't show you it today. But some of the examples will be a number of different uh, workflows that will uh, be injected automatically for you so you don't have to build the workflows. If you're happy with the uh, default workflows that we recommend, you'll be able to just use those out of the box. And so in this case, uh, one of the workflows is very basic, uh, similar to the crib install components, but if we bore into things, we'll see that the HA uh, crib stuff has a lot more tasks associated with it. So we have the, the traditional crib install piece we had before, uh, we have the etcd configuration, and then the crib get masters. Uh, once the masters are built on etcd, we wanna get that information uh, and inject that in. Uh, and then the final crib config piece, and there's a lot of changes in the crib config piece uh, from the original crib components. Um, and so you can take a look at those uh, details uh, going forward when you start playing with this. You'll see that there's a lot more that's going on in these pieces now. All right, so th that's sort of the basics and the mechanics. Um, oh, I was going to mention that in the workflows aspects, we're starting to add some operations patterns. So uh, some of the patterns that you'll see emerge going forward uh, are things like drain and uncordon, which are sort of standard operations when you need to do upgrades to workers or masters, you need to be able to remove the workloads from them. So one of the operating patterns we have going forward will be the ability to specify a drain pattern on a worker, that worker will be drained of its uh, container workload and the container workload will be moved by Kubernetes to other workers. And then you can do things like upgrade that machine. Uh, looking a little further down the road, uh, we have sort of a cluster management pattern for doing blue green and rolling upgrades. And all of that will eventually start converging on the Kubernetes uh, crib stuff where you'll be able to use things like the operate patterns to specify a drain and then do an upgrade through the cluster patterns and then uncordon the machine to put it back into operation. And then you can start rolling through your infrastructure to do those upgrade patterns and you'll start to see more growing operational patterns uh, from us from there. Uh, what else? Oh, we wanted to show, I wanted to show you the profile after it's built. So once you've run through the actual uh, crib operation, if we take a look at the machine uh, and we look at the decomposed set of tasks and stages, so we see that this machine has run through all of these stages and tasks right now, but we see that all of these decomposed tasks are listed uh, from the standard SSH access, mount disks, erase the disks, uh, Docker install. Uh, we set the time the cluster needs to have consistent time. This could grow in the future to be a more uh, stronger uh, NTP pattern. Uh, right now it's pretty simple, just NTP date sort of pattern. Uh, we do the crib install, which is the Kubernetes piece. We do the etcd configuration piece. We do that uh, get masters piece I was showing just a moment ago. Uh, and then we also do crib settings and crib dashboard. All of these pieces run through. And once that's uh, run through, we'll see that the profile, oh, hey, this is awesome. I did not know that we finally got the links in the machine object to the profile. So uh, now in the machine objects, we have the link to the actual profile. Yeah, didn't work. So got a little, little bit more work to do in the UX there. Um, but if we take a look at the uh, profile directly, we go down to KDES uh, one live demo. We'll see that, um, Starting with that example I showed you a moment ago, there's an awful lot of stuff that gets put in here. So this is all dynamically built from the cluster uh, running through its uh, HA crib install components. 
And in this case, uh, we see a lot of the uh, certificate stuff, uh, the CA name, CA password is obfuscated for security reasons. Uh, all of these sorts of things are filled in dynamically. Some, these pieces are all things that you can control as part of your cluster if you want, if you don't want it to be dynamically filled in. And like I was mentioning, I built it with a, a, a master count of one. So we see our server count here is listed as one in this case. And then again, we see our address name UUID spec for what servers to land that uh, etcd master on. And then when it's done, it writes its results out to the servers done. And so we can actually correlate between what needs to be done and what is actually done and completed. And then there is the traditional cluster admin conf that you should be familiar with in the original crib pattern, which defines the uh, Kubernetes admin.conf uh, details so you can operate the cluster in the same exact patterns as the original crib component piece, as well as the command, which is this is the important kubeatom uh, join token so we can add uh, additional machines to the cluster. Uh, going forward with our operational patterns if we wanted to expand our, our cluster name. Uh, and then our certificates, our cluster master certs. So these are all the, the cert data necessary for the si cert signing process in the back end. So our uh, HTTPS certs uh, all work successfully. Um, the master VIP was set to a uh, um, public address in this case on the machine. Um, and we see that the crib cluster masters, which we had defined in the example, this is that example uh, configuration information. Uh, one other little helper that uh, if you're using this setup template in the rack and content, or actually it's in the uh, setup stuff's in the community uh, content. So there's a parameter RS debug enable, which turns on some debugging. So when you look at uh, job logs, you get a lot more info out of the uh, process. Um, and that's more of a bash side process. So it enables things like set minus X on the um, bash side. Um, that's a quick walkthrough of uh, the cluster. The cluster was built up here. Um, like I said, it takes uh, right now about 10 to 15 minutes, I think, to build because we're pulling in Docker uh, and Kubernetes pieces from the uh, public repos. If you have internal repos that respond much faster, that process time will be a lot shorter. Uh, and then going forward, when we marry the um, uh, live boot builder, uh, we can do the live boot stuff with Docker and Kubernetes embedded in it, and then also the, um, the other content piece. Uh, image builder. So when image builder is uh, pre-built with a Docker con uh, Kubernetes environment, we can just load that uh, image straight onto the machine and jump straight into the configuration components and not have to talk to external uh, repos or in your internal repos to do the package configurations. That'll accelerate the installation time significantly. Uh, although uh, the crib, uh, HA crib stuff with kubeatom is still a lot faster than the Ansible kube spray stuff. The Ansible kube spray stuff is a lot more complete today in terms of capabilities, but it still takes almost 30 minutes in some cases to do all of its configuration uh, of a Kubernetes cluster through the Ansible Kube Spray um, playbooks. Uh, any questions on that? It's kind of a, a random wander through. Uh, I just got this cluster up and running not too long before the meetup, so I didn't get a chance to go through some operational patterns. Uh, to show everybody, but I was hoping to at least show the basics of how to operate it. Relatively similar to the same, uh, the only real requirement differences are the HA crib uh, is a plugin, and the certs plugin is required by HA crib. Uh, and then there's a little bit more uh, required um, parameter information that should go into the profile, uh, which I showed in that. Uh, example profile, the k 8 example. So these are sort of the basic requirements for the parameter definitions. Uh, as we get this fleshed out some more, we'll add uh, the integrations documentation. So the existing crib documentation that's in the doc tree in the integrations section, we'll add the HA crib pattern in there and get more documentation in there. So that'll live there as well. All right, that's a walkthrough of the uh, HA crib cluster stuff.
um, comments, thoughts? Nope, 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 okay. Excellent, uh, then we'll turn our attention to the last piece of business, which is, as always, we wrap up the day uh, with any community uh, comments, questions, conversation. Uh, this is your chance for all you folks who have joined in to fire off questions to us uh, on anything in general uh, around digital rebar provision. So uh, with that, any questions or comments from community? And Chris, if you have anything, I'm watching the chat. Okay. I'm Hey, this yeah. is Steve Spector real quick. I'm adding right. in the chat for everyone. Hopefully I did this right. I released last week the Digital Rebar Community Welcome Guide. And it oh, has yes. all you. the information and everything uh, to get started. I don't think I have it on rebar.digital yet. I think I'm still working on that stuff. But it is out on the RackN website. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, take a look at that doc. If you think I'm missing something or you'd like something added, please let me know. The other thing is on rackn.com slash rebar, I've been tracking community members from around the world. And so uh, if you're interested in seeing where community members are engaging with, and again, there's a lot of community members we don't hear from, but they engage. Uh, that map is up there and it's pretty and again that and that map information is anonymized data. There's nothing. Yeah, there's no um, people identifiable there. It's just yeah, IP address related hits, locality. But it's pretty. I think it's pretty cool to see it. So if you're interested, uh, you may want to take a peek at that. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. All right. With that, let's wrap it up. Uh, that's the end of 